Let's start. So we are pleased today. <laughs> Please. We, we are pleased today to invite uh, Cecilia Rica. She could have been an EPOC student, but she's not. Um, she's very close to EPOC students, for the alumni. Um, so she, she, she has become, uh, she's a raising star in the, the field of uh, industrial economics, innovation, and digital uh, industries, and she's working mostly on intellectual monopoly. She, she will give a talk for one hour, not more. Huh? Okay. <laughs> then we have the three discussants. Where, where are they? So, yeah, okay. One is missing, but the one is yes, close. Sorry. Okay, so you, the floor is yours. Thank okay. you, Cecilia. Okay. Uh, thanks, David, for the invitation. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here. And as I only have one hour, I will go straight to my presentation. And the presentation can be summarized by this picture over here, which was, of course, not done by me. I don't have those skills. Uh, Jay Christopher told me that after his seminar, he got a meme. I never had a meme, so feel free to prepare one for me as well. Uh, but I do have this amazing illustration. And it was done while I was speaking at a conference in Berlin some months ago. And indeed, it summarizes a lot of things. And since one image speaks more than all the words that I'm going uh, to, uh, to present to you today, I thought, OK, let's start with this. Um, synthesis of intellectual monopoly capitalism. And what I'm going to do today will be split in three parts. So the first part would be basically to introduce you to what we mean by intellectual monopolies, what's the framework, what we're discussing nowadays within this framework. And then I will give you just a snippet of my research on big pharma. And then I will uh, further unpack what I've been doing with big tech. and. I mean, it, to some extent, one could say that we can skip the big pharma case, but one of the main um, takeaways of today, I think, is that what I'm describing, what I'm trying to analyze is a global dynamic of capitalism. So it's not digital economy, it's not digital capitalism only, uh, even if uh, what's going on in the digital sector or digital sectors is paradigmatic or even a stream case of this uh, intellectual monopoly dynamics that we are going to, to discuss today. So I've been saying the word monopoly a lot. And for most people, speaking about monopolies would resemble this. You may remember it. And of course, this is not a uh, uh, the day to discuss about neoclassical microeconomics. But when we think about monopolies, even if we don't have this framework in mind, we still think of a single company. It can be. Uh, a single company operating in a market. And the next question, if we think about that, because that's the typical understanding. So a monopoly is one company offering in a market. And I'm speaking about intellectual monopolies. I have just said that for me, this is the way I try to, to conceptualize global capitalism dynamics. And indeed you could say, hey, but wait a minute, are you really speaking about monopolies? Most of the largest companies in the world are not really monopolies. And I mentioned the case of pharma. We have many COVID vaccines, for instance. So what we could eventually say is, okay, this is an oligopoly market, but a monopoly. Why are you speaking about intellectual monopolies? And we have many other examples also coming from tech, but one that is very interesting is the case of Amazon, which is a company that not only in principle, one could say that it's in competition, not only with all the other marketplaces, but with all the retails, with all the small stores selling things, whatever it's also sold on amazon.com. So really, can we speak of Amazon as a monopoly? And we can add something else, another ingredient to, uh, to this question, which is that Amazon actually is barely profitable. It hasn't been profitable for many years. And when it is, it's barely profitable. So if we think of a monopoly, again, neoclassical economics framework and also other frameworks, one would expect the company to be among the most profitable ones, a company with one of the highest uh, profit rates. And this is certainly not the case. Still, I could just argue, hey, no, but we can still speak of monopolies because think of Microsoft Windows or Microsoft Office, think of iOS and Android. I have a pixel and I cannot have iOS. I can only have Android. So in some cases we can, and, and also we have some examples of, uh, I think you are not seeing the next one. And I am, mm, why? 
I am having a technique. Ah, uh, it's a delay. Okay. Okay. I was like, but why am I still seeing the previous slide? Okay. So Google Android and Google uh, Android and Apple iOS. And uh, in other cases, even Google search engine, we can say, okay, yes, we're at least close enough to speak of a monopoly. But this is not what I'm interested in. And actually what I'm interested in and why I've been uh, discussing for some time now on intellectual monopolies is because I want to explain this. If there is anything in common among the largest companies in the world and to what extent understanding what's going on with these companies can also inform us about what's going on with all the other uh, individual firms and also with other organizations in capitalism and also if it's giving us some information to better understand the relationship between capital and labor in capitalism. So the question that can structure all this research or the starting point of this research because we will talk about many open questions is uh, if there's anything that all these companies have in common. And to try to make sense of this, I uh, think that a good approach is to try to rethink about uh, monopoly theory. So what can we do to start with that? In one second, you will see. Uh, <laughs> you will see um, a chart that shows you basically, or maybe you will never see it, that the research on competition and monopoly within the economics uh, literature has been quite diverse in the sense that the research on competition has been growing up. So more and more papers are discussing about competition. Nothing's happening, but it is. For the people on the Zoom, it's there. Do you think so? I think it's just a matter of the connection. Or maybe I can, before doing that, which will take some time, I will click again. No, there it is. Okay, let's see if now it works better. Okay, so I was saying, so the research on uh, competition has been growing over the years, whereas the research on monopolies has remained flat for the last 50 years. This is just a simple um, analysis of all the economics papers that have in their title, either the word competition or something related to monopoly, monopoly, so monopoly, monopolies, monopolistic, something related to monopolies. And this is why I think about, or I suggest that we should rethink about monopoly theory. First of all, because it has been a quite neglected subject within economic theory. And also, and this, I am so sorry, I have so many illustrations and clicks and things, it will take us some time. And also, uh, yes. And also when we look at the content of this research, when we see, okay, what has been discussed within monopoly theory, even if it remained flat, the number of papers working on the topic, what are these papers saying? Well, most of the papers keeps talking about neoclassical economics ways of understanding monopolies and also add some legal dimensions to the picture. So you will see some uh, keywords related to legal things. These are not the keywords that the authors put in the papers, but actually it's a text mining analysis of the abstracts. There is one exception and it's highlighted in yellow, and this is monopoly capitalism. So monopoly capital has been within heterodox economic thought. The main, and one can say this by looking at this chart, the main uh, school of thought dealing with monopolies and thinking about monopolies, not as one single firm operating in a market, but actually thinking of monopolies as companies that are concentrating mostly tangible capital. Concentrating property, concentrating tangible capital. But they have something in common, and even the authors that are, that are nowadays working within this framework, or to some extent departing from this framework, but still uh, drawing on it, share something with neoclassical economics and with all the understandings of monopolies, which is that at some point in history, we started thinking about the monopoly just as a firm holding something, an organization holding something instead of thinking of monopolies as a power relationship. So what we will discuss today is about monopolies as a power relationship, which means that we need to speak at the same time about the company that is monopolizing something and those that are deprived from that something, given that there is one firm that is in a privileged way accessing, using, or producing something. So, To think of this, I suggest going back to our 
rediscuss about property and what owning something, what property rights mean. And again, even if property means that we are depriving all the rest of society from something that we own, property is a social relationship. And we can build here on David Greber, who if you don't know who he is, I suggest you uh, read at least his book on uh, 5,000 years of debt, which for economic students is one of the best books I've read in my life. But I also suggest everything he has written uh, because he was an amazing author actually. And an anthropologist, well, in, in the way he works, we can classify him as an anthropologist, but actually he was a social scientist in general. And one of the things he says when he's speaking about the history of Deb and, 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 at, and at the same time about the history of markets and the history of prices and the history of capitalism to some extent is this emphasis on property as an arrangement between people concerning things. And of course we can extend this definition and say, that when he's speaking of people, it's not just individuals. We can also think as an arrangement between organizations, between an organization and an individual. So between fictive persons as well as individual persons or human beings. But before moving forward with our understanding, our current understanding of monopolies as a power relation, I want to, something that I said while I was uh, introducing this dimension of focusing on monopolies, not as something that is just as a relationship of the firm with the thing, as a relationship of the firm with other organizations, with, other, with individuals and so on, um, is not something that I invented. It's something quite obvious actually. And I, I'm quite sure that as soon as I mentioned it, everyone said, yes, of course. And actually this comes from many, many years ago. And I've been doing some historical research on this. And for instance, this guy at the same time when there were some laws introduced on how to regulate monopolies. This guy who was the attorney general for England and Wales by the uh, early 17th century defined a monopoly as, and I will read it, a monopoly is an institution or allowance by the king by his grant, commission or otherwise to any person or person's body, body politic or corporate of or for the sole buying, selling, making, working or using of anything whereby any person or persons, body politic or corporate are sought to be restrained of any freedom or liberty that they had before or hindered in their lawful trade. There are two important things in this definition that we lost on the way in which we studied monopolies. One is this power relationship, the emphasis on those that are deprived from what the organization that has been granted the monopoly now has exclusive access to. And the other one, is that monopolies not only refer to a monopoly for trade, or in this case for selling, if we think of a monopoly for buying, that in economic terms will be a monopsony, but it's also, a mon the monopoly can also be a monopoly for the making, working, or using of anything. So it can also be a monopoly for consumption. Let's say I buy a lake in the middle of France, and I decide that only my friends can come. So Alessandra, J. Christopher, David will be invited, but it's almost the first time I see most of you. So I will not invite you. I will be depriving you from consuming. It's, and this is not a typical monopoly, the one you think of in a market, but it's a still a form of monopoly relationship. I'm limiting some people from getting access to something that before they could have access to. So it's a case of, using a monopoly for the using of something. But of course, the monopolies that I'm more interested in are the monopolies of the making and working because this goes straight to how we produce, what we produce and who can produce what. So let's go back to the, uh, this idea of connecting monopolies as a power relationship with the idea of property. And we can first say that the effects on, uh, of this monopoly, the type of monopoly relationship, the type of power relation will differ depending on what is monopolized. So if it's a monopoly in the using, the economic effects will not be as extended as it if it is a monopoly over the making or the working. Because with the making, monopolizing the making and the working, I can use privilegedly those, whatever I have access to, and we will go deeper into that in one second, to accumulate. Whereas in the other case, it's just limiting others from using. But in the, in the case I'm interested in, the limitations will be, or the impacts will be at the extent of who can accumulate more capital than others. And when it comes to this, 
And when we speak about accumulation, we have actually two types of monopoly relationship. There is one that is extended all along capitalism, and this is the interclass monopoly relationship. Because the capitalists can be defined as those that have the exclusive ownership over the means of production in principle. Then we can discuss about Uber and other things. But in principle, the capitalists are the owners of the means of production. And the workers are those that are deprived from that ownership. So the capitalists have the monopoly over the means of production. And that power relationship is a structure around this monopoly power relationship. What I'm interested in, not because I don't think this is not important, this is extremely important, but in my research, what I've been focusing on is on the intra-class monopoly relationship. So this is a monopoly relationship between different types of firms, between different types of individual capitals. So basically, what I uh, will argue is that from the ownership of different means of production, we will be able to think or to derive different forms of monopoly power. And this is helpful because it allows us, if we go back to, and I will not do it because we, I, I cannot click so fast and come back and it will take us a lot of time. But if you go back to this idea of the largest companies in market capitalization, there are a lot of tech, a lot of pharma companies, a lot of uh, multinational corporations like uh, working for mass or producing like mass manufactured products like Nestle or Coca-Cola. But there are also, for instance, oil companies. And I also want to understand why all companies are still there among the top 100. They have a form of monopoly, but a form of monopoly whose impact on society, leaving aside the ecological impact, but in terms of capital accumulation, is not as expanded as I will argue it is the monopoly over knowledge. Why? Because if you're a Saudi Aramco, or if you are, or if you have a monopoly over, let's say, a piece of land in Argentina, where I'm originally from, the most you will be able to do is to rent that land to one capitalist or portions of your land to a couple of capitalists. But the same portion of land, you will only be able to rent it to one capitalist, to one person working as a capital and, and, and whatever that person will do there. Whereas if you have one piece of knowledge and you have exclusive access to it, you can offer as many people as you want to pay you to get access to that knowledge, or you can sell things based on that knowledge and reuse that knowledge again and again. Knowledge is not only non-rival, but it's even more than that, because the more you use knowledge, more knowledge you are producing. So it's even the impact of depriving others from accessing, accessing it will be even more expanded than depriving others from accessing a natural, a part of nature. And also, knowledge is used for every single production process. It's true, different forms of knowledge. It's not the same piece of knowledge. But for every production process, we need knowledge, whereas not for every production process, we need nature. If you want to be picky, you may say, but you still need to eat and you still need to go to work. So, I mean, yes, of course. But still, overall, what we can think of is that the exclusion from publicly using an element of knowledge is a global exclusion. And it's very easy to show it. We don't need to go back to what I eat and say that what I eat was produced with the land and so on and so forth. Knowledge has the potential to be a global commons. So when it's deprived, the effects, even the effects for the way capital accumulation takes place will be way larger than those of privately appropriating portions of nature. But of course, this is not new. It's not that now we are living in the first moment in history where we can find firms that are relying on monopolizing knowledge. And here you have some examples. I'm not going to dig into this uh, just because I want to move on to what's going on nowadays. But the difference is that what before were just examples that we could go and look for and analyze and understand, but we're not really at the core of how capital accumulation was being unfolded, now it's completely the opposite. Now we can only understand capital accumulation if, or this is what I think and the thesis that I want to discuss with you today, if we understand what intellectual monopolies are. Because basically it's, we can even think of it as a new era, as a new moment in capitalism where as it says here, capital accumulation is driven by the systematic, and this 
we, I will come back to both these two terms, systematic and expanding knowledge and information appropriation. So there are many ways to start discussing about this, and there, there are a lot of stylized facts. And I will start with some, but then I will show you what's the limitation of just looking at these stylized facts. So one stylized fact would be to start by looking at patents. So if we want to think of the privatization of knowledge, immediately one would think of patents uh, or any intellectual property right, but those that uh, are most known are patents. And it's clear that both patent applications, so the demand for uh, for protected, protecting with a patent and invention has been going up as well as the patent granted every year. And there have been key moments in this story and we will come back to discuss about them. But this is not just a matter of more patents. It's a matter of the concentration of knowledge which goes way beyond patents by fewer firms. So the other thing that we can do as a stylist fact, again, is to match this trend with who are the organizations that are patenting more. And what you have here on this side is for the, for the US uh, Patent and Trademark Office. Between 2011 and, two, and, and 2020, what I did was try to see how many times the different firms were in the top 20. I gathered all the firms that were at least once in the top 20 of patent assignments. So among the top 20 companies that received or were granted with more patents that year. And what you see is that eight of them were there every single year and you have them on top. And in total, we have 33 companies. So in 10 different years, in these 20 positions, there were only 33 companies and eight were always there. So this is again, a stylized fact on uh, the persistent persistence of innovators or at least of owners of knowledge. But a lot of this knowledge monopolization is kept secret. So patents are a way to disclose knowledge because to some extent, you know that there is a way to do certain things. You may not know all the details because the explanation on how the patent works may not be so clear. And of course, you will not be able to use that knowledge freely, but you know that that knowledge exists and it's out there. Whereas when the knowledge is kept secret and this, of course, uh, you can automatically link it to uh, to the production of knowledge for weapons or for things that are used for the war that's usually kept secret and kept secret by, uh, by, by state agencies and so on, but also by companies. And companies keep a lot of things secret. And in the digital economy, this has become increasingly important because big data sets are kept secret, because search algorithms are kept secret, and even all the research in AI is mostly kept secret. Even if a lot of that is published, Papers say, we developed an algorithm that does this, this, and that. They don't present the algorithm. So actually, they are just disclosing something that they did without showing how they did it. So secrecy is also quite important. And it's extremely important for understanding how global value chains work to extend a bit uh, from, from digital to other uh, equally relevant structures where we can see knowledge monopolization uh, in, in the process or in the making. The leading firm has the exclusive knowledge on how to reorganize, reintegrate the whole chain. What part of the chain can do what? And that knowledge is not like listed in a word file. Say, okay, if you need this, you go to this. If you need that, you, you go there. It's partly kept in a tacit knowledge in key management posi positions, in many protocols and documents. So it's, and it's kept secret by the firm. So. Uh, you may have read, for instance, uh, the issues with the supply chain of semiconductors and the fact that the U.S. state didn't even know who was producing what in the global value chain of semiconductors and ordered a report to get a clear picture to map which were the different links of the supply chain. Well, leading corporations that organize these global value chains know to the detail who can do what and who is doing what and how inside their global value chain, and this is knowledge typically kept secret. And there are many other stylus facts that I will just list here very quickly, which point to say that the companies that are doing better are those that concentrate more intangible assets. There are nonetheless some puzzles, uh, and I will give you two types of puzzles. One is 
the set of companies that are intensive in intangible assets but are not profitable. Like Uber, like Airbnb, is also the case of Amazon, impressively, and also the case of all the startup companies that are extremely intensive in intangible assets. Sometimes they don't have any tangible asset and still most of them fail. And there's another uh, puzzle, which is that some companies that are among the leaders are still highly or keep being highly intensive intangible assets. You can think of Walmart, you can think of TSMC, I was mentioning just one second ago, the semiconductors industry, but you can also think of Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. Because these companies, even if they don't manufacture anything, they are concentrating, and we will come back to this, data centers and digital infrastructure in general. I will provide you some uh, answers to these puzzles, but for now, we can keep this first idea that the companies that are the leading ones are those that are intensive in intangible assets in relation to tangible assets. And in particular, these companies are coming from certain industries. And two are the most important ones. One is ICT in general, so hardware and software. So digital platform companies, but also those producing the devices like Apple. And the other one is the healthcare industry. The third one would be the automobile industry, if you are curious about that. So basically, what I have said so far is that all forms of knowledge and information are increasingly being monopolized. And the question we can ask next is, how did we get here? How did we get from a situation where we could find some examples throughout history of knowledge monopolies, but they were not really, really driving capitalism. They were not really as important to even claim that this is a stage in capitalism that should be called intellectual monopoly capitalism. So how did we get here? And this is perhaps the uh, most packed slide you will see in your lives. Why? Why? Because I think that the answer comes from the unfolding of, of several dimensions that are mutually affecting each other. So it's not a single causality of things. It's not one happened and then happened and then two and three and four. There are many things coming together. So my risk of using different slides is to give the impression that the first slide is explaining what happened first or the most important part. So this is why this slide is so packed and also, and I will not uh, uh, hesitate in putting everything on the slide. And also, I think that it's a good summary of uh, that question of how did we get here? So we got here basically by, or how I understand it, by the combination of these four conditions. On the one hand, knowledge is produced to some extent like this shirt, t-shirt and so on. But there are a lot of specificities on how we produce knowledge that are exclusive of knowledge production or exclusive of producing creative things and that, can, that are completely different from what happens when we produce a t-shirt. The first thing is that knowledge is cumulative. So we produce knowledge on the basis of existing knowledge. I was mentioning before monopoly, uh, monopoly capital authors, and I briefly introduce you to how they define monopolies, just to make a step forward and say, well, they contribute to this extent, but I'm saying this other thing. So even when you're not fully uh, in line with what the past was saying, you still build knowledge on previous existing knowledge. On top of that, there is this idea of absorptive capacities and how they are different among different individuals. Let's say this is an open talk. Let's say that all the seats that are not taken, we invite people, random people on the street or kids, maybe kids are going out of school or kindergarten kids, we see them all here and they will listen to me. Let's say they speak English also to, to make the, the example uh, clearer. Even if they speak English, they will not understand most of what I'm saying. And this is because they have not inherited all the necessary knowledge that enables them to understand what I'm saying. So in order to be at the knowledge frontier, now I translate this to a firm, in order to be at the knowledge frontier, the firm needs and to remain at the knowledge frontier and to expand the knowledge frontier, the firm actually needs to already be in the knowledge frontier. So those that have systematically been investing in more R&D and have been systematically winning the innovation race will have more chances to keep expanding that knowledge frontier simply because they know more 
So if there are new developments out there, they will be better prepared to understand those new developments and to transform those new developments into innovation for the firm. So typically this can lead us to a situation where if we're in an industry and there is a firm that innovates by chance and it takes the lead for some time, <coughs> that firm, if it decides to invest more on R&D, it will have higher chances, all else equal, than all the other firms to innovate again. And if it's lucky enough and it innovates again, because of course there is still uh, uh, the doubt when, oh, and it, and it always remain, remains open whether it will succeed or not, but the chances of succeeding are higher. So it succeeds again and it moves the knowledge frontier again and it reinvests more and its chances to keep on winning this innovation race will expand because it will be potentially the only one at the knowledge frontier. So the only one that can keep absorbing more knowledge from the environment and transforming that knowledge into more innovation. So there is no reason in principle to think that after one innovation, any other firm of the industry will have equal chances to innovate than the one that has innovated because of the absorptive capacity, because the, innovate, the innovative firm will be the one that, it's, that has absorbed more knowledge vis-a-vis -vis all the rest. Also, and together with this absorptive capacity, let's say um, I'm, we are discussing about how Google works. And Google has DeepMind, which is a startup company that it acquired in 2014. And when Google acquired this company, it re the company remained for many, many years, basically just until last year, as a company that was mostly dedicated just to develop generic AI. So no clear business product for Google, but just artificial intelligence. But at the same time, Google has a lot of managers that were in charge of translating those generic AI models into potential uses for Google's business. So that translation capacity what the innovation studies literature calls management capacity is also asymmetric and is also built on absorptive capacities. So you also need to have these management capacities to transform generic knowledge, even generic knowledge that is being produced inside the organization into more uh, applied knowledge, if you want to put it in those terms. So this in principle can lead to a process of firms technological differentiation or stratification, where some firms keep winning the innovation race and other ones become technologically dependent to the technologies that are developed by the leaders. If you think at the same time that innovation in the past was not so science and technology based, what we have inherited with this idea of the entrepreneur is a way of innovating that doesn't exist anymore. Where you had someone, the inventor that could just with a few things, just a couple of money in his or her pocket, try to create something new. Creating something new that has business implications now is a very expensive endeavor. So you need to have a lot of money to actually be able to do the R&D in the first place. So this again, reinforces the cycle of winners always winning, losers systematically losing. But at the same time, since the end of the 19th century, we have been seeing different processes where that have contributed to making knowledge more private. And it's possible to sum up all these transformations into the big detachment on the embodiment and re-embodiment processes. The first one by the end of the 19th century was the process where workplace knowledge stopped being the property of the worker and became the property of the firm. So between the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, not only several uh, legal transformations took place, but also the ways, the practices in which uh, the relationship between capital and labor took place was transformed. The formal contracts that we sign now when we accept an employment were also introduced in this period of time. And among the things that they included, they started including the clause that the knowledge that was produced during our working time belonged to the company that was employing us. Of course, if we really think about this for one second, this is impossible. 
Because it's not that I change, let's say I move to another university and I leave my ideas and all my, like my brain at City University of London and what I start building a new brain from scratch. No, of course not. But it meant a lot of limitations in the way we could use the knowledge that we still had inside our heads. So it meant that if we have developed a new method for doing something, we couldn't use it in the new company or university or whatever we were working. So this was the first big detachment moment. The second one is the process. And if you think why detach the embodiment and re-embodiment, the embodiment because it's like no longer part of the worker and became part of the company. And eventually the, ma the machines or the products that the company was selling. The second moment starts in the, more or less in the 1980s in the US with another series also of legal transformations among them, not only the Bay Law Act, which probably you heard of before, which enabled uh, institutions and even firms that received public money to patent the results of things that they were, that were developed by using public money. So privatized, publicly funded research. But also there were several other transformations that one expanded what could be protected with intellectual property rights, including living beings, which was very uh, beneficial for big pharma companies because they could patent molecules, for instance. And also uh, it was enabled to protect with intellectual property rights code, lines of code or algorithms. So quite beneficial for the tech sector. And the length of the intellectual property rights was also extended. So it was a whole set of transformations that basically resulted in a more stringent intellectual property rights regime that afterwards was extended from the US to most of the world with, the, uh, with some uh, agreements, in particular with the TRIPS agreement, but also with some follow-up agreements. And something interesting about TRIPS agreement, which is the global agreement on intellectual property rights, is that it was drafted by some leading corporations. So IBM, Microsoft, and Pfizer contributed to drafting what ended up being TRIPS agreement. Another interesting part of this story is that China didn't comply initially with TRIPS agreement until it started significantly catching up in key technologies. And then it said, okay, now we're good. And, and we also uh, comply with TRIPS. But it was not only about the IPR regime, it was also about other transformations that favored companies intensive in intangible assets. If you avoid taxes and you have big factories and you want to say that your profits, you are making them in Ireland, it only takes to fly to Ireland and see that you don't have factories there, you don't have workers there. So how come you can say that all those profits correspond to your Ireland subsidiary? Whereas if you say that you have your patents in Ireland, who can tell you otherwise? How can the regulator verify that actually the knowledge is supposed to be there, that it was developed there, that it was correct that you uh, protected uh, patents that you claim were based in Ireland? And by doing this, co leading corporations that are intensive in intangible assets can basically shift profits to tax havens. And of course, by doing that and paying lower taxes, getting higher benefits or profits, that further reinforces this polarization between firms. In the US, but also in other parts of the world, since the, uh, the, the and in particular US, UK, but more in general, with the emergence of neoliberalism, it's uh, now box populi that antitrust was weakened. And there is a lot of discussion nowadays on how to rethink antitrust, basically because the weakening became we just care about the consumer. So we just focus on the price that consumers pay. And one may say, okay, but this benefits every single company in principle. If you're just looking at the consumers and you're not looking at how, for instance, what one company does affects other companies, as long as it doesn't affect the consumers. And therefore, if you're not focusing that much on limiting mergers and acquisitions because of their potential uh, impact on competition, this in principle should have had an equal effect on all companies. But no, because which are the companies that can concentrate without directly having an impact on consumers? Those that do not sell directly to consumers. Pharma companies in many countries, most countries in the world, part, a huge part of their consumers are states not direct consumers, not final consumers. 
So they can charge more to states, but actually, from this perspective of the individual consumers, they will not be the target, the main target of the regulator. And of course, an even more obvious case is the case of tech companies, because tech companies in many cases offer us things for quotation marks free. Everybody again now knows because it's uh, widely spread that we are paying with data attention and so on. But in terms of money for us, it's either free things or cheaper things. I, I'm traveling to Argentina in a couple of weeks. A friend wants a doll for, and, and it, this probably happened to all of you, especially coming from developing countries. There are things that for some reason are cheaper in poor countries. And then when you go back to your country, you go back with things that people ask you to buy them for. And so I will be traveling back with a LOL doll. It's cheaper in the UK than in Argentina. And I mean, the, my obvious reaction was, hey, just buy it on Amazon. It's obvious, it's going to be cheaper there. So what's the problem with Amazon then? And we'll come back to this later on. But of course, from this antitrust perspective, nothing's wrong the other way around. And finally, even within neoliberalism, it's not the retreat of the state. It's a different form of state. It's the retreat of the state in terms of social benefits, but it's not the retreat of the state in industrial policy. And in the US, there has been, and there still is, a strong industrial policy. It's not that industrial policies are coming back. They were always there. It's just that they were hidden. And industrial policies in the US were deeply, closely interlinked with the military strategies of the US. And no wonder why some of, or most of these leading corporations that became intellectual monopolies were particularly favored by the US military interests and uh, within this larger hidden industrial policy. So all this summing up is what for me explains why now it is so prevalent that it, became a new epoch or a new stage in capitalism and why now it's actually reshaping all the other social relations within capitalism so if we want to give um a quick definition of um, intellectual monopolies one could say that this is not just a company that has monopolized a piece of knowledge these are companies that are systematically capturing more knowledge and information on the basis of the knowledge and information that they have already captured. If they stop doing it, they will eventually lose the intellectual monopoly. And this is why they are permanent and proactive rentiers. This is not the idea of rentership that we have from Ricardo or from the analysis of, uh, of nature and rentiership. This is a different type of rentierism. It's a rentier that in order to remain as a rentier, needs to keep investing in R&D. And we will see how and, and what this entails. But the important thing to say is that an intellectual monopoly is a, a dynamic relationship. It's a dynamic power relationship that needs to be constantly reborn, reinforced, which means capturing more pieces of knowledge and turning more pieces of knowledge into the intangible assets of the intellectual monopoly. And part of this proactivity is also related to building a deterrence capacity, to limiting others, first of all, from limiting others to try to in, uh, commit infringements and use the knowledge that has been appropriated, but also at the same time, to build a capacity to be able to use protected knowledge developed by those subordinates without going to uh, without having to pay afterwards for that. So an intellectual monopoly would typically have always the law in its favor when it does things between quotation marks right and when it does things wrong. So Apple used Qualcomm's patents for many years and it never paid for using them. And Qualcomm tried to make Apple pay, but it failed. But don't you even dare using one patent from Apple. One important thing is that I, um, I speak and I will show you some data on patents, but I want to insist that this is monopolizing access to knowledge and this goes way beyond the concentration of intellectual property rights. It's just that we 
suffer from a huge lack of adequate indicators to understand this process. So this is why we need to rely on what is out there. And we are also working on new indicators. But in the meantime, and, and it's also because it's easier and everybody knows what a patent is, to relate this to the typical intellectual property rights. But I was mentioning before that secrecy, for instance, is of utmost importance. And we also need to understand or try to find ways to measure the capacity of a firm to produce knowledge that then it's not disclosed. And just so to give you a hint on how we think about doing this is going back to the source of knowledge. And the source of knowledge is workers. As much as they were detached from knowledge, they're still the knowledge producer. So typically a company that has more knowledge workers in different forms, it can be coding, it can be doing R&D, it can be also doing marketing, which is another form of building intangibles that is also based on a specific forms of knowledge and so on and so forth. So, looking at the workers of the firm will also give us information about the capacity of the firm to produce new knowledge and also the capacity of the firm to capture new knowledge. And again, intellectual monopolies are not necessarily market monopolies. These are firms that have privileged access to knowledge that may result in more market concentration, but it's not a necessary condition. What it is, is, as I was saying, that intellectual monopolies are a power relation. But so far, I have been focusing a lot on the firm again. So let's go back to the idea of the power relationship. And in the idea of the power relationship, what I find actually is that intellectual monopoly power is a relationship that is unfolded in two complementary ways. On the one hand, we have how monopoly power is exercised in the relationship between different firms in the production of new commodities. So in the reproduction processes of the t-shirts, the shoes, the computers, there is a power relationship. And I will come back to this in one second. And this power relationship is based on the fact that some firms have monopolized the necessary knowledge to organize the production process. But there is also another power relationship that takes place in the making of new knowledge. So the power, the intellectual monopoly power relationship is not only about how the firms that monopolize knowledge subordinate those that lack that knowledge and need it to organize production processes, but also take place when the firm, in order to produce more knowledge, will not necessarily rely on the knowledge that can produce inside but we'll also be organizing innovation systems with other organizations that will also be contributing to the intellectual monopoly of the leading firm. So focusing a bit on this first part, so on the accumulation, on, on the power relationship for the, the accumulation or production subsystems, I wanted to bring to your attention that in 1974, uh, Samir Amin, who is uh, one of the authors of the dependency theory, writing from Africa said, so long as production techniques were relatively simple, domination necessitated direct control of the means of production. That is in practice, foreign ownership of capital. This direct form of appropriation tends to become pointless as soon as the time arrives when, through technology, central capital is in a position to dominate the industries of the third world and, substance and draw substantial profits from them without even having to finance their installation. So basically what he's already anticipating is a power relationship based on depriving others from te needed technologies to produce. And of course, we know how this works because in between the idea of the pin factory of Adam Smith as the division of labor inside the firm where everything it takes place according to a plan, you arrive to work and it's not that you can do whatever you want. You have to do specific tasks that were designed and, and uh, organized in relation to all the other things that the other workers are doing. So on the one hand, we have the case of inside the factory, it's not anarchy, it's planning, central planning, what takes place outside the factory, in capitalism, in the market, in principle, every firm can do, produce whatever it wants. But in between these two, what we actually have is what Samir Amin was anticipating and what global value chain literature tries to uh, put forward, which is that planning, even though they may not explain it in this way, planning 
has extended or expanded beyond the frontier of the factory and has conquered part of the market relationship. And what you have here is uh, Tim Cook, so Apple CEO inside a Foxconn factory in China, looking at how uh, Foxconn employees are uh, assembling the iPhone. And uh, probably you read, and if you didn't, I strongly suggest you to read some pieces that went out you know, on Financial Times not so long ago about Apple and its supply chain and its relationship with China. And it explains in detail all the process of technology transfer that Apple uh, controls in order to make sure that all these suppliers are doing exactly things as Apple wants them to do them, but still without being able to become autonomous from Apple. So what we have is a planning relationship without ownership because Apple doesn't own Foxconn facilities but still plans, controls, organize the labor process inside Foxconn for the production of the iPhone. So we have this expansion of the planning frontier, and this is enabled by intellectual monopolization. This is enabled by the fact that Apple controls the essential, crucial knowledge of this global value chain to the point where it can also change from suppliers, and now it's in part leaving aside Foxconn and relying on other suppliers, especially after the uh, riots uh, that took place in Foxconn uh, during the final uh, moments of the zero policy COVID in China. Uh, and I will come back to this because this is a power relationship. And here I distinguish power from domination, but I will come back to this with one example later on, but just keep this in mind. Because before moving back to the other power relationship, so the power relationship that takes place in the process of producing new knowledge, let me emphasize that global value chains are not the only structure that uh, is illustrative of this dynamic. Platforms work in the same way. The franchising model, so the McDonald's stores that are all around everywhere, operate in the same way. The leading corporation concentrates the knowledge and uses that knowledge to organize, to control production processes in all the other organizations participating in this accumulation structure. And the firm, uh, exercising an intellectual monopoly will have in its hands the strategical decision to uh, make at every step of the supply chain to say, shall I produce this in-house or shall I? Is, is it more convenient to outsource it? And what I'm working on now is to try to show that what it's outsourced and what is kept in-house is directly related to what it's needed to reproduce the intellectual monopoly. So the firm will keep in-house everything that is essential for reproducing the intellectual monopoly. One would say, oh, okay, perfect. It keeps in-house the R&D facilities and it outsource manufacturing. That's the simple way to say it, but it's way more complex because within R&D, there are parts that can be outsourced. And even being outsourced, the leading corporation can still capture the knowledge integrated to larger projects and profit exclusively from it. And what we will see is that all these companies that hold intellectual monopolies outsource part of the R&D. And in some cases, they need to keep in-house tangible assets because these tangible assets work as means of knowledge and information appropriation. You can only keep on harvesting data from society at large if you own the cables and the data centers. If not, your position will not be as strong. So that explains why Google, Amazon, and Microsoft are intensive intangible assets, as we will see in one second. But let's go to the other power relationship before we move to the empirical cases. And here in some uh, work I've done uh, with, uh, with Val Lundvall, we discuss about this idea of corporate innovation systems. You certainly have heard of the national innovation system. It's a concept that has a lot of problems. Among them, it uh, usually neglects power relationships. The other problem is that although there are a lot of institutions that are contributing to the co-production of knowledge inside a country, more and more knowledge is produced globally. And it is produced more than globally, locally because it's global to some extent, but at the same time, highly concentrated in some hubs. But this idea 
the idea of the national innovation system can be mobilized to think of an alternative innovation system where power relations are key, are essential, where the firm that controls knowledge is the one that organizes the innovation system. And this is the idea behind corporate innovation systems. So basically, the idea is that there are several organizations participating in the production of new knowledge, but the general R&D orientations, so what is where the research is going, and the capacity to oversee everything that every single piece are of or different organizations are doing will be in the hands of the intellectual monopoly. And it will also be in the hands of intellectual monopolies, the associated profits. So typically the intellectual monopoly will be the organization profiting the most from successful innovations. And by outsourcing part of the process, it will also be reducing the risks. And at the same time, it will be maximizing the chances of success because it's impossible to have a single group of researchers that are the best in everything inside your firm. But if you can map who are the best in every single piece of knowledge that will be part of a larger project that will keep on driving your innovation, then you can just outsource each piece to the best. And this of course is aided by the fact that knowledge is becoming more science-based and also that it's, it's becoming easier to modularize science. And also something that I didn't mention from the larger slide uh, before, because I didn't want to keep on discussing of all the pieces coming together is the role of new technologies. Because now a firm that is at the knowledge frontier, so a firm that has the largest absorptive capacities, it just needs to go to Google Scholar to find the latest developments of a specific problem. So it only takes one second with internet to find out what's happening where. So this has also contributed to building corporate innovation systems that do not rely on geographical proximity as much as they should have relied before if they had existed as such. The result of all this process, of course, is that since knowledge that is co-produced by many becomes the source of additional profits for just a few, we can speak of knowledge predation because there is a predatory relationship, a direct relationship of, of exfoliation or expropriation of something that was produced collectively, but then uh, is for the benefit of the intellectual monopoly. And as a summary, we can speak of different types of subordinate companies. No. No, I will need more. Oh, let's say Trichet to go back. We don't need Trichet. <laughs> no, okay, okay. I will, I will uh, speed up. So as a result, uh, we have different type of subordinate firms. Uh, and it's not that any firm, that every firm subordinates in the same way. Some will be early adopters of new technologies, typically Foxconn in relation to Apple. Some will be laggards, but will still be part and, and will not uh, go bankrupt because they will be able to super exploit their workers. The early adopters also do that quite often, but in particular, the laggards uh, do that even more. And they do so uh, as a way to compensate for their uh, lower productive capacities and, and therefore be able to offer services at a cheap price so that they still participate in the global value chain or in the franchising model or the platform and so on. And then we have a company that doesn't ultimately produce parts of commodities or new commodities, but that produces knowledge, that produces pieces of knowledge within these corporate innovation systems. And that is what we can define as innovating companies and the startup is the typical example. So if we think of, um, and these, I will need to go very, very fast, so probably will only ring a bell of those of you in the you know, that come from Taring. I'm so sorry, but it's not that relevant, so don't worry. So if you think of this, uh, these patterns of innovation in the economics of innovation literature, one based on Schumpeter's creative destruction, so the early Schumpeter, and the other one based on uh, the late Schumpeter, which uh, can be described as creative accumulation, Malerva and Orseni will speak of two ways of doing innovation. In one, you have the small entrepreneurs, they all have equal chances of succeed. And this is the typical case of a lot of firms, no hierarchy of the innovators, and innovation is constant in a very turbulent scenario. The, at the other extreme, you have cases where always big companies innovate. 
And the explanation is what then authors like Philippon nowadays call the good concentration, because the idea is that you need these large firms with very big R&D laboratories, because the knowledge base, what it needs to be produced is very complex, and it needs to be produced in very large environments, so small firms will not be able to produce this type of innovations. You need a lot of R&D investment, but in both cases, even in the case of the large firms, there is a dynamic that remains, which is the idea that after innovation, eventually innovation will take place. In the case of Schumpeter Mark II, so in the case where the big companies are the innovators, not every company, but the big company is the innovator, there is always a catching up process. Catching up is always incomplete and different. The adoption of the innovation always means adaptations, always means changes, and it's not perfect, but it still takes place. So there is a still imitation, there is a still adoption of new technologies, and eventually, therefore, there is diffusion of the new technology, and it is diffusion, and all the complementary innovations that are developed after the original one, what lead to economic growth. So in both cases, Schumpeter Mark I and Mark II, we have this cycle of innovation, diffusion, economic growth. What I'm explaining here is a different pattern of innovation. Yes, the big firm is the one that profits the most, but it's not the only one producing the innovation. To some extent, what we have is a core of leading firms that profit the most for, from innovation, a stable core and a turbulent peripheries with many other firms that are contributing pieces, but are still unable to profit from the process. So here, the first thing to distinguish is that we no longer have this cycle. And why? It's not because innovation doesn't take place. For some authors, the problem is that most of the things that we call innovation are not real innovations. Debatable, but I don't have the time to discuss that. If you're interested, we can come back in the Q&A. But even if they're less based on science, or even if they are just marginal in some cases, there are still innovations. But it's not that part what has changed. What has changed is what happens afterwards, is the fact that even, even getting access to the knowledge that now is monopolized, most of the firms do not have the means to absorb that knowledge. They don't understand it. This is a cycle where the more you learn, the better you are prepared to learn. And the less you learn, the worse you are prepared to learn. So even getting access to part of this knowledge will not be enough because the firms will need to have the capacity to understand what's out there. So diffusion is curtailed, and this has an effect on economic growth, of course. And therefore, we can speak of a lot of differences in terms of number of innovators, the way innovation is concentrated, and so on. But the most important takeaway here is that, unlike Schumpeter Mark I and Mark II, we must distinguish between the co-production of knowledge and the appropriation of knowledge. Before, the innovator was at the same time the one producing the knowledge. So the production of the knowledge in Mark I and Mark II, the firm that produces the new knowledge is the same firm that harvests the associated profits. And here we're looking at a scenario where that has changed. This is stratified or polarized or unfolded. So summing up the theory, and now I don't know what I will do in five minutes with all the rest. We can think of monopolies of a power relation between those that have and those that want or need, but have not and cannot independently overcome this lack. So in a very general way of thinking. And in the case of the perpetuation of intellectual monopolies and firms technological stratification, which are two sides of the same problem, what we can eventually think of is also a new pattern of innovation. And this pattern of innovation at the same time is a twofold power relationship in the two ways we've been discussing so far. And a simple example is the pharma industry. Probably you heard uh, that uh, this is a story, but in case you hadn't, I have, for instance, some doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. But actually, when we call it the AstraZeneca vaccine, this is misleading because the research was developed in the University of Oxford and funded mostly over 95% uh, with public money. Researchers initially said that they wanted to either sell the vaccine at the uh, cost level or at a very cheap price and make it accessible to everyone. But then there were some pressures, including pressures from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who is a main donor of the University of Oxford, 
who ended up uh, getting us a different outcome that AstraZeneca has the exclusive rights over this vaccine. But this is not just something that happened in the middle of the pandemic and everyone was desperate and regulators were trying to do whatever they could, but it was not the time to take care of all this. This is just one example of a structural way in which this industry has been working for decades. Here you have the declared source of funding in the scientific publications of Pfizer, Novartis, and Roche. When you publish a paper, you need to say who funded it. When researchers from these companies publish papers, they also need to say the same thing. You cannot know how much money they received, but you can know who gave them some money. And here you can clearly see that on top of these companies working together and funding each other, the money comes from public institutions. And the second largest funder, the first one that is external to each of these companies is the US National Institutes of Health. And something else is how to map corporate innovation systems. So I've been claiming that these organizations outsource R&D and that at the same time, they're capable of appropriating resulting knowledge for their own benefit. A way to map this is by looking at scientific authorships, because when it comes to publishing a paper, all the collaborations are included. But when it comes to patenting, of course, they appropriate the knowledge. So we will not be able to, by looking at the patent owners, we will not be able to trace all the organizations that participated or collaborated in the process that ended up with that patent. But if we look at the scientific publication, we will not get the whole picture, but we will get at least part of the story. And here, what I do is I use a network mapping precisely to map the most frequent co-authors in this case of Roche in that period, so in more or less the last decade. And what you can see is, first of all, that if you compare the share of co-ownerships with the, with the share of co-authorships, it's quite clear that this company is not co-owning, uh, is barely not co-owning any patents. So here, not, not only, here you have the number of patents and the share of patents co-owned. And all the patents, all the patents, all the papers from Roche have co-authors from other organizations, almost pretty much all, all the papers. So from almost collaborating for every single piece of scientific uh, publication to less than 7% of co-ownerships, which are mostly with other firms. Whereas the publications are mostly with universities, which means that universities, public research institutions are contributing a lot to the profits of big pharma companies. One other relevant thing in this thing, in this story, is that not only uh, other, not only universities and public research organizations are found in these network maps, but also other big pharma companies. This is from Roche, as I mentioned be before, and here you have Amhem, Pfizer, Novartis, Abi, Bristol Mayer, Spire. First impression is okay, they collaborate for technology, and that is cool. They also compete for technology, but what is it exactly that they are collaborating on? And now I'm working with a colleague precisely on analyzing these collaborations, and what you can find already here, I will go back so you can read it. Toxicology, legal medicine, and this is also quite general, pharmacology and pharmacy. What they're actually doing is writing papers on how clinical trials should take place, on how the industry should be producing the drugs. So basically, it's, a more, it's more of a way of using scientific publications to impose their own ways of producing to the whole sector. It's a way to influence regulators as well, and to say the right way of conducting a clinical trial is basically the way I do it. So they work together on establishing the processes in which the industry should be working, and they publish it in scientific papers instead of just publishing them in reports. Why? Scientific papers have another, have a higher uh, value when it comes to uh, a device that can contribute to setting or defining what is true. Very quick, big tech. So in the case of big tech, again, we can find the same dynamics. 
scientific publications with hundreds, even thousands of other organizations, also scientific publications with other big tech, for instance, Facebook, Google, and even Huawei. We, here in the map, it's also, I cannot see it super fast now, but Alibaba and other Chinese tech. So also technological cooperation, between intellectual monopolies and also the same dynamic in the comparison between co-authorships and co-ownerships. And here you even have like the share of co of co author publications. So 88% of Microsoft publications in this decade had co-authors co that were not working for Microsoft and only 1% of all the patents that were co-owned with someone that was not part of uh, Microsoft. And then just uh, splitting one by the other, you can get this knowledge appropriation indicator to see the extent of this appropriation. And here you also have this idea of corporate innovation systems being global, but at the same time concentrated in some hubs. And you have this for Microsoft. So Microsoft has co-authored publications with 120 countries, but almost three quarters of the papers have at least one author from the US. And interestingly, the second country in importance is China. Microsoft is the only big tech that has a strong presence in China, and it has had it for decades now. China would, the Chinese state, of course, would have wanted to replace Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office with Chinese products, but they couldn't do it. And Microsoft works also quite closely with Chinese big techs and with some Chinese universities at the same time to develop knowledge. I don't have time to discuss about this now, but just to say that when it comes to cities, therefore, uh, it's even more concentrated because we say, okay, China and the US are the most important places for Microsoft. Well, it's not China and the US as a whole. It's a few places. So a few cities in the US, one, two cities in China. So knowledge is, the production of knowledge is globalized, but at the same time, it's highly concentrated in a few parts of the world. This you've seen it already. This just to emphasize that it's not that I'm doing cherry picking. It's not that I decided to bring you the examples of the companies that give good results for my research. I've been doing this for many, many companies and it's always the same. It's always publishing with a lot of, of institutions in general, patenting alone. But what is uh, what are big tech publishing on? What are they doing research on? If you look at the content of the publications, what you see is that they are focusing on artificial intelligence. And in particular, they are focusing on a method within artificial intelligence or approach that is called machine learning and within machine learning, deep learning. And this is not just adding a technicality. This has the potential to shift our understanding of how means of production work, basically. Because deep learning are algorithms that have the capacity to learn, to adjust by themselves, the more data they process. So the more data is processed, this is a means of production that gets better. It's a means of production that the more we use it, instead of depreciating, it appreciates. But this means of production only works with data. And if you look at all the keywords in blue, you will see that the research comes together. It's the algorithms with the data and with the functional applications. What are these companies doing with this AI? They are doing computer vision, they are doing language recognition and so on and so forth. And I'm sure that you all played with chat GDP these days, so I don't need to explain a lot how this works. But something, and precisely talking about chat GDP and other things, something that you may have also heard is that a lot of AI is being developed in the open source environment. Oh, super cool. We are counterbalancing the power of the intellectual monopolies world, in fact, these companies not only appropriate public knowledge from universities, but they also have the capacity to appropriate knowledge that is developed at the level of the open source software environment. In the 1990s, Microsoft said, or, and, and um, one of the, the, the former CEOs of Microsoft said that Linux was a cancer. And in 20, and, and less than 20 years after that, Microsoft was buying the largest platform for open source software development and not to privatize it, to keep it public, to keep it open source and to even foster more and more developers to participate in that environment. I mean, did Microsoft become at some point, I don't know, the candidate for the Peace Nobel Prize or something like that? At least we should doubt about it. 
What happened is that they found a way to profit from this. I mentioned before that knowledge is modularized. Code is the clearest example on how to build models, how to build parts, steps, pieces. If you manage to put in open source pieces that are not essential, that are not your edge, but that once you integrate the piece to the larger puzzle, once you put back those ingredients into your sauce, always keeping the magic special ingredient secret, basically what you get is the best developers in the world working for free for you without risking anything. And this is what happens in the open source software environment. And here you have one example. Among the top 10 projects that were put in open source, in, this is 2018, then GitHub stopped publishing this data and it's more complicated to do it, but we are still on the way to do it and, and more globally. But among the top 10 projects, there were three uh, from uh, big tech companies. So Microsoft, Facebook, and TensorFlow was put in open source by Google. And if you look at the number of contributors, so how many uh, developers or how many emails, how many users of GitHub contributed to the project in 2018, and you compare that to the number of registered developers of each of these companies, so people that have a profile that whose email associated is at microsoft.com or at facebook.com, you see a huge difference. And this difference is basically telling us that there are thousands of developers working for free for these companies. Of course, it can be for many reasons. They want to get noticed. They want to contribute to the open source environment. They are curious. I don't care about the reasons. Materially speaking, they're still working for free for uh, big tech companies. But it's more than that, because also part of what is put in open source contributes to expanding the power of these companies, because they use what they put in open source to build new standards for the industry. So if you want to build AI models, you need to use TensorFlow. And that's it, because that's the standard, which means that you use Google ultimately, and which means that all the complementary products that will not be in open source and that Google will sell you on its cloud will operate better with what you are developing, just because you are using something that was developed originally by Google. So why is this different? How many real minutes do I have? Okay. So this is one step forward from what we've been discussing about intellectual monopolies. It's not just appropriating more knowledge on the basis of the existing knowledge. This accelerates at a, at, at a speed that we could have never imagined before digital technologies. Because basically we have companies that have a never ending source of innovation. They have the largest platforms in the world, and therefore they have constant streams of data entering into their data centers and being processed with their AI algorithms. Part of these algorithms were developed by universities, part were developed by the open source environment, integrated all together in, uh, and, and the whole package kept secret by these companies. And this whole package keeps getting better and better as we speak. This is on Zoom at the same time. So we're also contributing to improve not only Zoom's algorithms. We are contributing to improve Amazon Web Services algorithms because every single tech company, excepting those that have their own cloud computing business, needs to use the cloud of a big tech to operate, which means that they are not only storing data in these companies' clouds, but also using services. And this in a context, I will come back to this in one second. I will skip what Microsoft says. And I unfortunately will have to skip this concept of Mika. But I will just say that, but I will still leave the slide one second because it's cool. Mikas are a part of what we've been discussing about today. The Mika is the mean how to get the knowledge that is produced elsewhere to be privately appropriated in your company. How you do that? You not only need to have people that can understand that knowledge and absorb it, you need to move it from one place to the other. Intangibles have a materiality. And that materiality, for instance, in the case of data, are data centers. In the case of algorithms are data centers, processors that can process that data. And you also need to move the data, which means that you need to 
have cables, that you need to have satellites, that you need to have all forms of infrastructure that enable you to capture the data from where it's produced and put it where you want it to be. So all these are a tangible means of information and knowledge appropriation. And the platform itself, it's Amica, because the platform itself work, works as a way for big tech companies to keep capturing more and more data. And this is why, something that I've been saying, these companies are not just capturing knowledge and capturing, uh, da capturing data, which is complicated to proxy. And here you have some examples of, of the, how to proxy part of the data that they are harvesting. But also these companies have a lot of digital infrastructure because this digital infrastructure is essential for their intellectual monopoly. It's not just the assembly line as in a device that therefore can be outsourced because it's not essential to the intellectual monopoly, but the data centers are. We will skip this nice video of how basically big tech companies end up having more than 50% of the undersea internet cable. So they are serious about this. It's not just, okay, let's put one, two, three data centers. It's let's really also monopolize the tangibles. But let's focus here and here I will end. We know, wait. This is also at the basis of how they expand the, in their intellectual monopolies. It's not just companies that, uh, it's not just, I, I promise that I will end here because this is the final, final part. And I will leave all the policy and all the discussions for another day. It's not just that they are the leaders in the tech sector. They are also using it to enter into other sectors. And one of the papers that was uh, given to you as a complementary reading for uh, this discussion was precisely on how Google is entering the healthcare sector and also talked about how other big tech companies are also entering the healthcare sector. It's not just that they are entering to offer digital services. They are becoming suppliers. They are even trying to discover new treatments for drugs. They are changing the way we approach to healthcare, for instance, with wearables, with um, uh, electronic medicine and so on. And they are also, and I highlighted this because of one of the, the key parts of the epoch, they are also even trying to control uh, efficient energy, energy systems. So also become intellectual monopolies in the ecological transition. This we, and to conclude, I'm, I'm skipping this. The cloud is a key part of this. And I go back to what I was saying about Zoom improving its algorithm as much as Amazon Web Services, and I finished here. Since almost every company in the world depends on these companies' clouds, whenever all these other companies harvest some data, they process the data in part with algorithms provided as a service by big tech companies. An algorithm provided as a service is not getting access to the code, but it's getting access to a black box. You can use it, but you don't really get access to the code. So your chances to learn from using a cloud service are limited. Whereas the algorithm is learning more and more while more data from other parties is processed. So it's a process where learning is shift and the producer keeps on learning, whereas the user of the technology keeps on lagging and dependent on that technology. So this is a way to, as I was saying before, expand the dynamic of intellectual monopolization to a level that is not just what we can see with pharma on, or other companies. And with this, I finish uh, because I already spoke for too long. Yes, yes, it's mine. Do you want to uh, change it? Yeah. yeah, sure. You can get the um, exactly. Just leave it like that. Thank you very much. Well.
I stopped, but uh, but my computer. Yeah, I no, or maybe I didn't. Maybe we just. Or stop, stop. Uh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, welcome. Uh, it's just that you will need to connect it again. But how? I will be taking notes with the phone. It's not that I will not be paying attention to you guys, just to let you know because you need. It's okay. Uh, is it working? Yes, it's working. Logging. No. No, it's still mine because it's still give me give me one 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 second. If because it's in presentation mode, you need to end the presentation mode here. No. End show. End show. No. Oh, you need to start no. and no. exactly. Just the end this one. Yeah. Maybe just expand it. Wait. Save, save. save. Oh. oh, no, no, ça avec les... no, c'est avec le workshop. I know. Okay. Yes. I know. okay. Can't you just expand? Is it? A, is it? A, no, it's because no, no, no. It's because it's in. A, no, me less one. Exactly. That's yeah. why. Can put it to no, this one is full screen. No, this is explore. It's like this diapositiva. In the chat, format herramientas de extensiones. Por qué que no puedo poner? Okay, because I cannot find the way to put it as in full screen. But still, if we share it, it's okay. No, se ansiaré. No, me se pasé. No, she let them. You want so? No, 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 se pasa. Organizar herramientas, extensiones, ayuda. I think this is fine as it is. Okay, this is fine. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Thank you, Professor Cecilia Hikab. Um, okay, we'll be very fast. We don't have too much time now. Um, I'm Gabriel Bruna. We are from Brazil and Noto from Finland. Um, you, you can already go. 
So summary, we're going to go to the papers we had and a bit on the concept of uh, intellectual monopoly capitalism. And then we're going to introduce three discussions, time, space, innovation, power. Uh, we're going to discuss if it's a new form of capitalism, some ideas behind it. And then we want to bring a discussion on accumulation in this, in this intellectual monopoly capitalism. So first, for the summary, we had three articles. We have one, art one slide for each article. It's super nice. I would recommend you all to go to them because you can see in, in their chronological order how the concepts are being created. And it's really great. The first one, it's a study on China and catching up with artificial, artificial intelligence. And it starts with the national innovation system as a framework to get to the corporate innovation system, which is something that Cecilia is proposing in the paper. It's something bigger than GVC. And it's funny now I have a, even my notes here to so everyone to, to see. But it's something bigger than GVC because it incorporates innovation ideas and also not only vertical, but also horizontal. Okay, so it's a bigger concept of this corporate innovation system. And the idea is that um, you use basically AI and application in the, in, in the production of digital services. And this is at the core of the second phase of the ICT revolution. You guys know they're going to propose you are in the second phase of it, the first in the 70s, 80s, and now this one. And what is the technology that is at the heart of it is deep learning. Chinese state was able to use a mix of its national innovation system, corporate innovation system to um, catch up. Okay. And, but they had a weakness and it is kind of interesting because she predicts with Lund, Professor Lundwald that there was a new weakness in Chinese model, which was the semiconductors and AI chips. And we know that now the US is precisely attacking China on this. So it is kind of a prediction. And okay, we can go to the next work, which was a work more theoretical, I would say, um, where we are presented to the intellectual monopoly capitalism. Professor starts with the distinction between the kind, the, the Smith and Marx uh, markets, she always likes to, forms of production. So what is the argument behind it? So there was anarchic production in the, looking by the markets and the technical plan production inside the firm. So the control inside the firm. Now what is happening is that this control is going beyond the firm to the market. Yes, which is basically we just saw. Um, so this intellectual monopoly capitalism is doing this. It's monopolizing knowledge. And I think this is the most important part of it because they are monopolizing methods, methods of innovation and invention. So they are self-perpetuating themselves in this way. It's like uh, taking the ball home and nobody else can play. Uh, yeah, nobody's discovering the goal anymore. There are no goals in the, the match anymore, but now because, because you own the ball. So they're owning the ball of the game. Um, they are data-driven, big AI, and they are planning portions of capitalism. This is very important. They are planning whole capitalism to this, the power consequence. And then, well, I think here are some things we're gonna go to our comments later, but this is leading to some global innovation networks and now capital accumulation is no longer defined by ownership. Um, these corporate, corporate innovation systems, they plan production and they subordinate, subordinate co companies, as we saw, and they are knowledge predators. And this is very important because it's at the core predation. As Professor mentioned at the very beginning of her presentation, it's something intra the capitalism. Yes, yeah, so they are fighting each other. Um, and this is the focus. We're going to go back to this. So there is the thing you're sharing patterns involving around this. And there is one conclusion there. Now we're going to also come back in our discussion that now accumulation and growth are being hijacked by these companies. And this is reinforcing center and periphery dynamics. And remember this in your mind, this hijacking thing, we're going to go back to this. Last slide um, on the, the article. Um, there was a discussion about infrastructure power and intellectual monopolies. Um, so professor is going to kind of enter a discussion with this uh, infrastructure, infrastructure cap, uh, capitalist idea against the intellectual one. And she's going to say the intellectual one is, goes more and goes beyond. It's not only providing the infrastructure. And they do this in two ways. As the last example of Google, they have already a lot of data to innovate. So they arrive in a new sector to kind of colonize it. So they have already more 
data to do it. They can innovate easier. And when they arrive to a new sector, there is also the intangibles prospecting the driver, which means that they now, because they are in a new sector, they have access to more data. So it's kind of a loop. Okay, now we have more data. We arrive to a new sector. We have more data. We arrive to a new sector. And this goes on and on. They restrict learning by using. They just provide black box boxes of knowledge. And they have a expansionary strategy. Um, okay, now for our discussion. Um, first, Bruna, please. Thank you. So first, I'm happy to be here because as a major C student and also the only one major C1 student, when my first semester was in Torino with major A people and Torino people, so it's innovative and it's exactly what you were talking in your presentation. And it's impossible to talk about it with, if you don't talk about time, space, and power, as we saw. Okay. Yeah, so we need to try to rethink these, uh, these ideas and the particularities that we were studying. And we need to have the the idea to rethink the past with eyes in the future, because we are trying to think about in a combination between past, present, and future, so the time that we are talking here. So when you talk about it, we are talking about challenges, and also we are talking about opportunities. So it's important to say that when we talk about innovations, when we talk about economic profit, social and public desire, sometimes they don't work together. Sometimes they, they work in different and opposite sides. And, but they are important when we are talking about different and levels of capitalism. And here we can see the opportunities because we, ha we have the opportunities now that we can try to avoid the same mistakes that we have in the past, but without forgetting history. Uh, yeah, okay, yes. So when you talk about intellectual property rights and innovation, we need to have an idea of that this kind of uh, topics they treat like artificial barriers of entry, and also they concentrated few in the few hands investments of those kind of opportunities. And when you talk about the history of economics and you go back to list, and he talks about the, yeah, of course, he's not gonna talk about industrial property rights, but he's going to talk about the, the market and the industry. You can connect it between this because you can see the difference and the, yeah, you can. You can see the difference and also how, uh, the money and how the ideas, how the knowledge are concentrated in different ways, but not in different ways. I'm sorry, it's still the same way. If you, if you can see, it's still the same countries that we are talking about. So we have knowledge, innovations, and the IPS, and they are important for developing countries. It's impossible to think just one thing if you don't think about all the rest. And when you talk about it, you also talk about global geopolitics because you are talking about countries, you are talking about um, communication, also you are talking about the, the way of development in this in the world that we are living now nowadays. And nowadays, the monopoly position, they are not a, um, a relationship against markets. It's a relationship, as we saw with the presentation of Cecilia, that's a relationship of concentrations of capital, but also in the legal monopoly and over someone its technology. And sometimes they go be behind uh, nationals, uh, national points. And when you connect this with uh, today, when you connect this idea with uh, what we see now, it's important when you think about the future um, uh, policies and regulation, that is the part that you, you were talking that you don't have time to, to talk in your presentation, but we can read on the paper that we are talking about the future. We talked about the policy regulations. We need to talk about the transparency. And also because now we are talking not only about platform, but we are talking about the conglomerates of soft softwares that they have everything in just one thing. So also we can we can connect with a concept of Veblen because we have the capacity to centralize and in one business and just one thing in just the hand of one one main firm so in this count in this case of country. And also we can connect with the idea of Prebish, the CEPAL, that's a structural heterogeneity because now of course, in this time, we are not talking about the technology that we are talking now. We are not talking about the monopolies and the digital transition, but we are talking about an equal movement that keep and that maintains the difference between central and periphery. So we can talk also about it now and today, because when you talk, when you think about uh, uh, technological knowledge and, and innovation only for 
a single idea and you don't think about the plurality of this, you can close your eyes for all the things that you can maintain and that you can keep repeat. And another thing that we were thinking about when we were reading is the connection between the idea of Carlotta Paris and the opportunity that we were talking in the beginning, because as I said about the challenge, also we had the opportunities that we have the options, not options, it's not so simple like that, but we have this, we are in this kind of graph here because we have the more exclusion, exclusionary uh, topics and also the more supportive, we have the possible state and we are here in the new paradigm. So we need to try to look uh, with eyes in the future, but don't forget the past. So this is my question that I, I try to formulate it, but we are going back to the questions in the end. I was just thinking about it, how we can make something um, real, because when you talk about the massive process of obtaining technology, we need to think about a social level. And when you think about it, how we can make it uh, something real, how we can make something, of, how we can make it this uh, real process of appropriation of technology by society. Yes, and now we can. Okay, um, so I wanted to talk about whether intellectual monopoly capitalism is a new form of capitalism. And when I started reading the papers uh, and I read the word monopoly, intellectual monopoly capitalism, I thought about monopoly capitalism right away and this literature around that topic. And basically, um, the people who kind of introduced the idea were Barn and Sweezy in 1966. And they kind of based their ideas uh, on Kolechki and Robinson and other people who also talked about imperfect competition. And their argument was that um, nowadays oligo oligopolistic firms engage in non-price competition and perfect competition is turned into imperfect competition. And this has huge uh, impacts on the economy, the capitalist economy. So one thing that it does is um, because there's no more price competition, you have inflationary pressures, you have higher markups and you have higher profits. Um, yeah. And I was wondering how similar are these two frameworks, so intellectual monopoly capitalism and monopoly capitalism, and how thoroughly does intellectual capitalism change the laws of motion of the capitalist economy? And I will look at two things here, which is competition and the falling rate of profit, even with the danger of seeming orthodox Marxist, but uh, let's go. Um, so first about competition. So I guess we all know what imperfect competition is. Um, but basically the idea is that, yeah, there's no more price comp competition, Olip oligopolistic firms set prices, um, they do marketing and all these kinds of things. Um, and yeah, and Barnes and Sweezy argue that because of imperfect competition, there's no more rate of like fall falling rate of profit in the economy. Um, but yeah, there's a tendency for profits to increase or surplus to increase. Uh, against this, Anwar Sheikh argues that there is real competition um, which means that um, despite their size, all firms are price setters trying to increase productivity, cut costs, and have a lower price relative to their competitors. And when this happens, um, you have lower profit rates in absolute terms um, because firms are interested in maximizing their profit rate relative to their competitors. But this will lead to lower profit rates in absolute terms. Also, when firms equalize prices within an industry, um, this disequalizes dis profit rates within an industry because you have different capital stocks and vintages. Um, but capital flows between industries equalize profit rates um, yeah, between industries. And here, Sheikh introduces his concept, regulating capital, which means the regulating conditions of production. So when you invest in, in an industry, you always invest in some kinds of capital, not like the oldest kind of capital, whatever. Um, and therefore, when we define regulating capitals in this way, we can look at the incremental, incremental rate of profit. And Sheikh argues that if these kind of like fluctuate around a value that is close to zero, that would implicate that there's real, real competition in the economy. And then we get this, uh, which is kind of, it's kind of a monster, but um, so basically it shows the incremental rates of profit in some manufacturing industries. So I. I basically replicated what Sheikh does in one of his studies, but I did it in a longer time period and I chose these um, industries because I just found data for them. But basically, yeah, like what we should see here is that like there is some kind of fluctuation process and this would indicate that at least in these industries, there is some kind of real competition if Sheikh is right. So I wanted to ask you, but these are of course not, this is not about big tech, but this is manufacturing. 
But do you think that there's a similar kind of process going on in, 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 like in the case of big tech companies and all these things, like intellectual monopolies, whether it is, it is real competition that they are kind of doing or imperfect competition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then secondly, talking about the, about the falling rate of profit, because uh, the monopoly capital school, that it doesn't, like, it doesn't exist anymore. And Anwar Sheikh argues that it does. Um, this is just to contextualize what has happened in the US since 1982. So we see that the um, income, income growth of the bottom 90% has stagnated. Um, the income growth of the top 10% to 1% has increased, but the group that has increased most uh, is top 1%. And yeah, I, but this is something we all know, but this is just a different way of like showing the same thing kind of. So the blue line is um, real wages and the black line is productivity. So we see that they grow together um, until the neoliberal era and then they diverge. And basically, yeah, again, I, I just replicated what Sheikh did. His graph ends here and I just like extended it. Um, so basically you can check what is the relationship between these two here. And then you just like calculate the counterfactual uh, real wage that the workers would have had. And this area shows how much workers have lost because of wage stagnation during neoliberalism. And this takes us here. So this is the rate of profit, finally. Um, so we see that the US rate of profit had a falling tendency until neoliberalism, after which it became stable. Um, so basically, this is what the monopoly capital school would maybe assume. Um, that like, yeah, this is what happens in monopoly capitalism. But then you can calculate the counterfactual rate of profit uh, based on the counterfactual real, real wages. So you can calculate how, ma how, many wage how much wages uh, workers have lost. And then you can take that out from profits and you can get this. And you see that uh, the rate of profit would have become negative during the financial crisis and it would have remained somewhat negative until the COVID crisis. Um, so this kind of brings us to the to the debate between monopoly capital school and uh, falling rate of profit theory. Because, yeah, monopoly capital school says that this is how it works. And then the falling rate of profit theory says that this is actually how it works. But monopolies have been able to do this, or companies in the US have been able to do this because of higher exploitation. Um, so, my question, or two questions. The first one is Does intellectual monopoly capitalism change the laws of motion of the capitalist economy? especially in terms of competition and the rate of profit. And the second one is, should we view intellectual monopolies gaining profits from mere inflation that results from non-price competition? So basically just inflation and higher markups. Um, or should we see them as rentiers that reinforce exploitation globally to counter the falling rate of profits? Because then it would be about labor value and like kind of trans, uh, um, moving that labor value from, let's say, from the global south or from workers um, to these companies in the U.S., for instance. But yeah, and now uh, Gabriel will discuss. Yeah. We made a follow-up question on what, building on on this part that Otto just presented, and then we come back to Baron Sweezy, and we'd like to ask you if you think, for example, the corporate innovation system would be an ultimate form of imperfect competition in the sense that now that you have the monopoly over the method of innovation, you are just blocking everyone from everything. You block profits everywhere and you increase your rents. Um, and then this leads to a second question we'd like to make to you. Um, where do these, these, the rising rents go? I mean, can they keep on forever? Um, and is there any realization problem as it existed in, in for example, in the Baran, Paul Baran and Paul Suisi um, prop, um, framework? Because they would argue, okay, we don't have effective demand for the, all these ex excessive profits and surplus. Um, and they would say, okay, this could become either waste consumption or investment. And they would say, no, none of that is happening. That's why capitalism goes through crisis all the time. There is kind of a hard and instability concerning investment for them. But do you think this will apply the same for your framework when we know it's not profits of surplus, it's rents that you're going to work with? And this leads us to a more general question, which is which all this literature of Marxists that we presented and you are working with, they what they're trying to answer. 
like what is the driving force of of capitalism if not profits not surplus can be predation um and then please Otto and I like just to make a side comment if not accumulation in total yes you can say inter firms or inter sectors uh, what is driving capitalism and maybe I think not so clear for economies I think when you talk about cap uh, capitalism for economists we're always thinking accumulation and profits because these are categories we work with but maybe I don't know I think you would agree and like to hear your take on this capitalism is about power so if what they are doing maybe they are blocking accumulation in total blocking profits but they keep their power in the hierarchy and okay how do you then we enter the sociological and more so, social science we know you like this in, interdisciplinary so we'd like to ask you this to end thank you and we leave the questions for you yeah. okay okay um Thank you a lot. Um, like you touch upon a lot of things that I didn't have time to discuss, so I will run with some slides to answer faster. But at first, I will engage with the uh, regulation, the regulating capital uh, discussion from Angwar Sheikh. And sorry for those of you who are not familiarized with this very marginal debate within Marxism. Uh, <laughs> Regulating capitals retain the same idea of all the schools of thought, where basically it's like Schumpeter Mark II. So basically you have some companies that have innovated and that are, that are using the most advanced techniques. All the others are still in the using previous techniques. And then there is another company sometimes coming from outside, sometimes from inside that becomes the new regulation, the, the, new, the new regulating capital. So the process for Shaikh is still a process where anyone can in principle innovate and the innovation leads to diffusion and economic growth. And this is basically what I'm showing that is not happening with this dynamic of self-reinforcing intellectual monopolization. So this is the first distance from what uh, Sheikh brings to the table. With monopoly capital office, they cannot explain the source of the power actually. They know that they have concentrated a lot of tangible capital and they see and they end up explaining that these companies have a monopoly power because they charge uh, a price that is above the, what's supposed to be the normal, but they end up having quite a close explanation such as neoclassical economics because they do not explore the sources of that power sufficiently. So yes, of course we build on and we, in, we are inspired by monopoly capital, but we also have a lot of critiques on that. Then another critic is that yes, it is a departure from capitalism. I think, and, and here I will throw bombs that I will not have time to really explain, one, it doesn't make sense to speak of an average rate of profits. So all the tables or the graphs with average rate of profits of the US, a single country that is not illustrative of the global dynamics, say nothing to me. First of all, because I have shown that firms are stratified, are structurally stratified. So we should analyze the profit rates of different types of firms. We cannot think in the same way of how a company will profit if it's an innovating company, if it's a laggard company, if it's an intellectual monopoly, or if it's an early adopter. On top of that, we cannot look at these dynamics inside one country. This is more global capitalism than ever. If we only look at the US, you're only looking in part at a country that is biased towards more advanced technologies. So you're missing, for instance, all the affecting global value chains and how that influences. And this is key for understanding accumulation. For instance, a lot of analysis on financialization basically say capital is no longer being channeled to uh, a tangible investment and is going to the financial sector. Well, this is a very global north view of what's going on because actually tangible investments are taking place but in the peripheries in Asia in particular and because the firms that are leading corporations are concentrating part of the value that is produced elsewhere and have that extra value and they don't pay taxes with that they don't need to invest in new tangible machine or means of production because they are outsourced they keep investing in more knowledge but at some point part of that money stays liquid these companies have a liquidity that is incredible in particular the big tech but not only they acquire other companies with that money but also of course they keep it and they use it for um speculation and financial purposes so um 
So yeah, so there, I mean, one key thing in relation to shake also is we cannot look at these dynamics without looking at global capitalism. And another key dynamic is that there is no equalization of the profit rate among the regulating capitals. Go and look, for instance, Walmart's uh, historical profit rate and Microsoft historical profit rate, one around 10%, the other one around 40%. No, definitely no, uh, and no movement again, there cannot be movement between one industry to the other between regulating capitals precisely because they are all monopolizing knowledge. A pharma company will not become a big tech. An automobile industry leader will not become a pharma company. And the only case of companies that can seriously endanger other, other um, intellectual monopolies business is big tech. And this is because they are monopolizing the method of inventing and using this new method of inventing to revolutionize other industries. But this is still a challenge because for the case of big pharma, it's not only about developing, developing a new drug, it's also about knowing how to convince the regulators that your drug is the good one. It's also about knowing how to convince the physicians that they need to prescribe your drug and all the knowledge on all these things is captured by big pharma. So it's not a given that even with the data and so on, big tech will be able to overcome big pharma in that sector. Things that I didn't have the time to discuss were the effects. And one of the things I was asked about in one point were the effects and what is to be done. And I don't know, I will just put this here. We don't care about Siemens. We don't care. I can share this with you afterwards. We don't care that much about the difference between power and domination at this point, but we do care about the effects. And in terms of the effects, predation and rentiers are zero sum games. It's not that rents come out of the thin air. Rent is appropriated value that is produced elsewhere. So the effect will be an effect that is combined. There is a process, of course, of creation of new value, even at a company like Google. It has workers, they are producing new things. But what we make emphasis on when we speak of rentiership is how by monopolizing access to something, that nobody else can produce and get access to, the company can capture value from other companies. So ultimately accumulate on the basis of the labor that takes place in units of production that the company that is accumulating doesn't own. About the question of what is important and are profits as important as before. This morning after breakfast, Joel Rabinovich, Cedric Durant and I were discussing precisely about that. And our conclusion was, that is both profits and control. And companies can, intellectual monopolies can sacrifice profits as Amazon does, sacrifice profits with the aim of expanding their control. So it's at the same time, it's not a thing of, okay, there is like political power and economic power. They are both actually part of the same process and reinforcing one with each other. The effects are of course felt at different levels. Super exploitation of workers, I mentioned it, but another effect is this. This is the world nowadays. Of course, Europe is angry and wants to regulate because it's absent in this world picture. And this is very immaterial, but something that, and of course, well, this I will skip it, is how we cannot understand all this process without the US and China states contributing to these companies and at the same time how the US and Chinese state are dependent and there is the key thing the only key important thing of all these slides super cool is this which is the juxtaposition of policy spheres and the discussion about who rules so when it comes to control is who sets the norms who decides so I like a lot the football analogies especially after Argentina winning the world cup and and I would say that it's more than owning the ball we own the bar, like intellectual monopolies own the bar. So intellectual monopolies own the rules of the game, how football is played. Now it's 11 against 11, but tomorrow it can be eight against eight or 15 against 15. The size of the, uh, the pitch can be doubled or whatever, or instead of playing with a ball, we will play with a bottle. It's up to them to decide that as well. So this is where there is a juxtaposition of power. Because in principle, those deciding the rules are the states, democratically elected, in principle, in principle. But also invisible things here, the extraction of nature, no time to discuss it, I'm so sorry, and the extraction of knowledge and data from the peripheries and other parts of the world. 
Because again, remember that the fact that this is how the world looks like, it doesn't mean that this is where value is produced. Value is produced everywhere, knowledge is produced everywhere, data is produced everywhere, but the profits of all this process where it's accumulated is in a few countries. And all this we can skip it, what is to be done? Final question. There are some avenues of hope. There are some avenues of hope. Part of them are on the... <laughs> avenues of hope because finally, after trying and after insisting for years and decades and so on, that the focus needed to be the market, there are some regulations still not introduced, just timid attempts that are starting to tackle the knowledge problem, that are starting to tackle these companies as knowledge gatekeepers and not only as market gatekeepers. And here you have some examples of things that are being discussed as we speak, but also there are avenues of hope because there is a lot of activism against these forms of knowledge appropriation. And this is something to highlight as well and not to forget that although we need to discuss a lot about what are the right policies, we also need to be sure that those policies will never happen unless there is really grassroots movements and organizations and unions pushing for those transformations, discussing, first of all, why this is needed and pushing for this. So what is to be done? I, instead of saying what is to be done because I don't have time, I would just emphasize a claim on activism. Questions and, and things to discuss about this topic, which I find very interesting and relevant, but I'm going to focus on two. Um, on the regulatory level, do you think that the right, a right strategy is to break down these monopolies? And the second question is, uh, and you kind of mentioned it in this hope of avenue, do you find digital commons as a truly, a stra truly effective strategy against these uh, intellectual monopolies? Thank you. I will write down the questions. It's a good option. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and all the discussions. So uh, my first question is uh, that uh, <clears throat> I read also your book about uh, the different uh, four degrees of intellectual monopoly, especially in the last uh, degree of uh, data-driven uh, intellectual monopoly. So I want to ask that, uh, um, do you think that the data-driven innovation has been improving a lot from based on the Schumpeter Market 2 innovation uh, are we already entering an era that we're okay? We, we don't have we don't need the uh, Schumpeter market to where well, we don't need uh, sorry we don't need the Schumpeter market to innovation anymore. We just need the data driven innovation. And uh, the second part is the, about the regulation. Also, Joaquin has mentioned that I want to ask about uh, your opinion. Um, uh, corporate innovation system, a uh, what kind of uh, geopolitical issues should be uh, implemented? Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. I wanted to know you, you, um, what you are thinking about the sovereignty of the states are the most important point to defend their interests than to ex being able to extract the knowledge. Uh, my question is similar to Hawkins' question about digital commons because uh, you mentioned the uh, cloud platforms. They are mostly privately owned. Uh, do you agree that uh, the way to regulate these platforms furthermore is uh, to make private data uh, into public good? Like um, this proposition of research such as Marina Mazzucato. Do you agree with that or you think that there is uh, like an alternative way to regulate these platforms? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, so first, uh, last year, uh, Amazon, for example, lost half of the market cap. A lot of the big tech companies lost a lot of the market values. So I was thinking if they have so much power uh, and so much rent, why are they losing so much market uh, value? And what are the, the main challenges to these companies? Is, it, is there something pushing them to expand also in terms of, of maintaining their profits and the power? And second, um, I think in the monopoly theory school, there's 
they started looking at the 1800s and then you had also very strong monopolies like the Rockefellers and so on. And there was a push for antitrust policies, for example, in the US kind of to save the capitalism somehow. Uh, do you think this is a possibility? Do you think is it's relatable to those times somehow? What we're living today also in terms of geopolitics of the conflict with China? Okay, my mine is uh, also kind of connected to Joaquin. I'm from Major A as well. I think most of us were the ones asking questions. I think we've cited you several times in all our papers and our debates. And yes, this was a debate uh, for mine the other day. So um, I really enjoyed your presentation. So it's very stimulating. Um, so um, I wanted your thoughts on, um, from a Commons perspective, what uh, kind of expound on essential data um, facilities. Um, how does that work with the commons framework for you and regulation? Um, and then um, maybe a little bit more about um, regulation relating to ex extraction of, of knowledge um, in relation to the global value chain. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your lecture. My question was about um, uh, how intellectual, like how uh, the pattern-based regime also has this tendency to uh, take local knowledge, convert it into this modular, I, like patent-based form, and only then it has value. So anything that exists outside of this intellectual monopoly is not considered knowledge. And I wanted your comments on, on this. Very last one. Very last one, Sissi. Okay, amazing. Um, yes, hello. Thank you for your lecture. I'm going to try to be very quick as well. Um, Yes, <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, financialization and how um, it's like mainly focusing on the global north, but of course there's also like the uh, analysis of financialization that focus on the domination relationships. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think uh, the results would be in this framework if we were to break up these big uh, knowledge monopolies? Okay, and I stay close to you. <laughs> okay. Let's see, I will try to be brief. I breaking them up since I have the slide over there. So in the case of big tech, most of the things these companies produce um, work as natural monopolies. So think of the search engine. If we had to go to 10 search engines and then find the good answer, actually we will not even find a good, an, an answer as good as the answer we can find in Google. Because since Google processes all our searches, it processes way more things altogether, and there are these economies of scale that are produced that make the search to be, at the outcome of the search, the results to be even better if we are all searching on the same search engine. So we are all contributing with our searches to make the results better for all of us. And this sounds beautiful because this sounds like we're all contributing to make our life better and easier with the tiny, but actually not so tiny detail that we're also contributing to make one company, in this case Google, more and more profitable and accumulate more and more at the expense of all of us and making us watch a lot of ads and redirecting part of our attention to things that were not actually what we wanted to do when we searched in the beginning. So breaking it up will make us lose this. You can also say, okay, let's break up, for instance, this, let's make Amazon Marketplace one company and Amazon Web Services another company. You can even do that, but the fact, but for instance, I don't know if you knew that Alibaba is actually many different companies. Ant Group is separated from Alibaba. Ali Health is another, formally, it's another company. However, they cross the data with each other, and that's what eventually would need to be uh, limited or forbidden. At the same time, it will limit the um, the services they are providing. They will not be as good. So if and how, this, how does this work? Well, basically, a financial, uh, the fintech business uses data from the marketplace to know who can pay for the credit, what are the, the credit scores of different people, and who wants to buy things and cannot buy it, or is not buying it, and in principle could buy it if it received a credit. So basically, Alibaba, even if formally has two separate companies, in terms of analyzing data and using 
the uh, digital intelligence that results from analyzing data to improve its businesses is one single company. So breaking them up, even leaving aside all the geopolitics, because first you need to convince the US state to do it, and they are the ambassadors of the US global hegemony, so I really don't think the US state will agree on breaking them up, but leaving that discussion aside, one, it will not solve the underlying problem, which is knowledge monopolization. And not only between the formerly the same company, these companies are in technological cooperation with each other. These companies also do cross licensing agreements of their patents. Samsung and Apple do cross licensing agreements of their patents to produce the, the, the smartphones. They need each other's patents to produce the smartphones. They just do cross licensing agreements. And those that are really limited from accessing the knowledge are all the rest. So although they are separate companies, in terms of monopolizing knowledge, they come together. So breaking, this, breaking them up will not solve the problem for several reasons. Then digital commons and, this, uh, and the discussions about what to do with data. The problem of the discussion of what to do with data is that it's not only about data. So there is a group of uh, people from an NGO that is called IT for Change, for instance, who have been claiming for a long time about making data public. But if you make data public, we discussed today about the differences in absorptive capacities and the differences in terms of who keeps secret the most advanced algorithms. So if we put all the data public, who will profit the most from that data? Those that already have the most advanced algorithms. So it's not just about making a data commons and then leaving all the actors use the data or just making data public. Again, leaving aside the geopolitical discussions about that. It's also about realizing that it's not only data that we are producing all together, but also knowledge, also the algorithms, because the algorithms get better with our data. And also because those algorithms were in part developed by developers from the open source, by uh, scientific workers from universities and so on and so forth. So what it needs to be done is to make all this public, not appropriated for society, eventually it's reappropriated for society because we were stolen. And this is the, what we need to change. It's not that we are the expropriators. It's not that the state is not defending private property or property. This was ours. This is something that we're all producing together and it's been systematically stolen from us. So it's just been fair with the rules that are still within capitalism, what I'm asking for eventually. It's not that I'm claiming for any form of other so society to come, although I think it would certainly be better, but still within the rules of capitalism's game, these companies are stealing from us. So it's not only about data, it's not only about knowledge, it's also, third thing, about the digital infrastructures. Europe wants to build a public cloud, the European Commission. Do you know who's going to help the European Commission? US big tech, because Europe cannot do it by itself. So the infrastructure is essential. And if the states don't come together to build the infrastructure, nobody will be able to do it. I had more questions, but I don't know if I have time. OK, I don't. I will choose one more then. <laughs> uh, I liked a lot the question about sovereignty. I think that we need to rethink that I will not answer, but open more the question. Uh, I think this uh, encourages us and even obliges us to rethink about our concept of the state. We cannot think of what the state is without at the same time thinking about what these companies are. And they redefine each other. What a company can do is redefined by what the state does and how the state positions itself and the other way around. But another thing, we cannot, as much as we cannot speak about firms in general, and we need to speak about these layers of firms, the same thing happens with states. So one thing is to study the relationship, the mutual entanglement and co-constitution of the US state with its intellectual monopolies, the Chinese state is its intellectual monopolies, and all these multiple relationships coming together. And another thing is to study how intellectual monopolies relate to and subordinate peripheral countries' states. So this is another layer of complexity to all this power relationship that I think that needs to be studied. So indeed, and going back to all the questions that tackle, okay, what is there anything that peripheral countries can do? I think that there is, there are some learnings from China, which basically prevented US intellectual monopolies to enter China 
while it was building its own intellectual monopoly. So there is a part to learn. So there are policies that need to be done, but a part to challenge or think differently. First of all, because any China is unique. No other single country has the characteristics of China in terms of the place it was occupying in global value chains, the value that was being channeled to China, the importance of its internal market and how so many companies were to some extent willing to do things in China and so on and so forth. So there are many specificities of China. China emerged in a moment that doesn't exist anymore in capitalism. But on top of all those specificities of China, we don't want to have our own intellectual monopolies. Latin America has Mercado Libre and this is not contributing to development. I mean, the company can be great. And for middle income people, it's very cool to go to the groceries and pay with your phone. But the question is, how is that affecting those local producers that earn even less than many of the workers that are professional workers working for companies elsewhere that now need to give a portion of every sale they are making to Mercado Libre? just because for us, it's more convenient to pay with the phone instead of having cash for many reasons. So to me, it's not that the solution should be to become China because China in the process of becoming China has also become more polarized. And that's something that also needs to be discussed. And I finish with this.